you hear a lot of stories of we're so overwhelmed. We had very little time to wrap up this property. It needed to be listed for sale. I only had a week to do it because I've got family and other responsibilities and a lot goes in the skip bin, which is usually contrary to most people's values and it's probably contrary to the values of the person who's passed. And it's often very heartbreaking for the people who are doing that work, the families that have to come in and they go, well, I've got no option here. The volume of possessions, I can't sort through this methodically. And that can be really contrary to their values and cause a lot of heartaches. Welcome to Don't Be Caught Dead, a podcast encouraging open conversations about dying and the death of a loved one. I'm your host, Catherine Ashton, founder of Critical Info, and I'm helping to bring your stories of death back to life. Because while you may not be ready to die, at least you can be prepared. Don't Be Caught Dead acknowledges the lands of the Kulin Nations and recognises their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nation peoples around the globe. Arwen Dropman is a qualified social worker with additional training in grief and loss, disability, chronic illness, hoarding disorder motivational interviewing, neurodivergent affirming practices, and compassion-focused therapy. She has worked as a professional organiser since 2017 with her business, Calm Space, founded at the start of 2020. She has lived and learnt experience of disability and neurodivergence. Arwen cares deeply about professionalism within the organising industry and joined the Institute of Professional Organisers Board to make a positive contribution to the sector as it grows and matures and is the board member responsible for membership and accreditation. Arwen describes herself as in her 40s, young enough to do the lifting and shifting required in a decluttering session and old enough to bring some life experience to her work. She lives in Brisbane, Queensland, is married with two teenage sons and has found a newfound appreciation for vintage items. Arwen, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Catherine. Now, Arwen, tell us, he's a professional organiser. Professional organiser is a person who works and provides a service to people who need assistance managing possessions, spaces, time, tasks, errands. Really, it encompasses a lot of things. Often it's very focused on decluttering and organising spaces, but it can be around time and tasks as well. Yeah, okay. And so what sort of services do you offer as a professional organiser? You you covered on a a few things that you do, but Mm. if you can sort of break down like what sort of things does that cover, I suppose, if someone was looking for something? Yeah. So there's probably a few different groups of people that they get in touch and different needs they have. So uh, one of the main ones would be decluttering. So where people have excess possessions that are getting in the way of the use of their home or they're feeling very overwhelmed and stressed about that. Uh, so to help people make decisions about what items to keep, what items to let go and how they might approach that job. Occasionally those jobs get very large, the clutter and the excess gets quite a high volume before an organiser is engaged. And people often feeling very overwhelmed about the size of the task and how to start, what to do with the items that they declutter and how to make good decisions that they feel confident about. And, you know, we want to prevent high levels of regret. So people are often worried that they're going to regret what they, the, the things that they that they pass on. So uh, a professional organiser can help people guide people through the process and the decision-making. Organisation, so when people are finding their environments are disorganised, there might not be a lot of excess, but the way that possessions are stored, there's no order to it. They don't know where things are. This can uh, create a lot of problems with managing time, so hard to get out of the house on time. We don't know where things are. So organisers can help try and put systems and setups in place to help people maintain organisation across the home. Uh, Organisers can also help with things like routines and schedules and managing tasks, so implementing systems with people and helping people really get clarity about where their time is going and where they want their time to be going. Uh, some organisers offer what we call concierge services. So that's where you engage a professional to book appointments, manage services, maybe plan travel, 
uh, you know, drop off the dry cleaning, physical errands as well. Uh, so there is that element to professional organising as well. And then there's a little subset of photo organisers as well. So people who uh, help people to catalogue, to uh, save and back up their photos, to organise them and then present them in a way that they can actually be enjoyed through albums or books. Uh, so that's also would be encapsulated in the, the professional organising industry as well. That is very broad. Yes, it is. Yes, there's something for everyone. <laughs> yeah, there is. And obviously your background as a social worker must really provide you with a good set of skills moving into this industry. Yeah, I think having a good understanding of people and the issues faced by people, their place in society and some of the structural issues and disadvantages or advantages that people experience, as well as the sort of psychosocial or the social emotional landscape for an individual, uh, that really helps. Uh, my work as a professional organiser, I've very much taken those skills and focused them in on one part of people's lives. But organisers spend a lot of time with their clients and often we end up providing other types of support as well and get to know people very well. So it does help me to, uh, yeah, definitely bring a breadth of experience to a very sort of focused part of type of work that I do. And obviously it's very personal work. You're obviously in people's homes, you're dealing with people's possessions. So tell me a little bit about, about that and, and how, um, you know, I suppose the importance of, of the Institute and, and how you got involved with the Institute. Yeah. So the, yes, you're right. Off the, you know, a lot of people who engage an organizer, it's not always just a once off service. Sometimes these are, you know, projects that can extend if we've got whole homes that are people are wanting to organize or whole homes that need decluttering. It can be a, a relationship of several months or more, depending on the needs of the client. So, and, and you do get to know people very well when you handle their possessions. You're asking them questions about their life. We need to understand their lives as well and how that relates to their possessions. So when you handle possessions and talk to them about people, uh, people about them, you get to know a lot about the people. So the intimacy between an organiser and a long-term client can be quite high. We, you know, there's there's also some give and take. The, our clients get to know a bit about us as well. So yes, we have a very often very strong and close connection with clients. The re, one of the reasons why I accepted a position on the board of the Institute of Professional Organisers is because of those sort of close ongoing relationships. A lot of organisers do have. It's really important that as a as a currently an unregulated industry that we are looking toward professionalism with the indie industry. We don't want to harm people with our work. We want to support them. Often they're very vulnerable when they come to us. And being a part of the Institute is really reflecting that value that I have, that we increase professionalism within the industry and, and are doing the right thing by clients and really looking at what the best practice is when we do this type of work in people's homes. So tell me about... You, you just mentioned regulation there. Tell me a little bit about the role of the, the Institute and the fact that it's not currently regulated and, and what your involvement is. So uh, professional organising is uh, a relatively new profession and industry. Uh, I like to term it as emerging. So it's it's been around for a little while now and longer in the US than in Australia but it's experienced a lot of growth in recent years, and but it is an unregulated industry, and it's not really a very well recognised industry. I think uh, people, the awareness around it is growing through like things, TV shows like Marie Kondo's show and the Home Edit. There's decluttering shows as well on TV, and that's often where people might become aware that this is this is a service that exists. TV shows aren't always a great reflection of what really happens for people when they uh, engage a service. So, but that's often where people, there's been a lot more in the media about it, news of paper articles and magazines and online articles about decluttering. There was a bit of a focus on it during the pandemic as people were spending a lot more time at home. And some of these issues were a bit more confronting because people weren't able to escape if they were in cluttered environments or disorganized, it was that it was right in front of them and they were there was a bit more focus on that. In terms of the Institute of Professional Organizers, you know, the path to industry recognition and, and regulation is long. And but we're taking steps to to get professional organizing more recognized officially. 
uh, and then hopefully that that some standards for what the educator, what you can reasonably expect when you um, engage an organizer of what kind of training they might have had and what kind of ethics, uh, you know, is there a code of ethics or a code of practice that they that they follow when you engage someone, but that will still be a long journey. So is there a code of conduct code of conduct that the members of your association have? Yeah, so we, we term it a, a code of practice. And so when people join as a member of the Institute of Professional Organisers, they uh, have to read and agree that they will follow that code of practice. And that includes aspects of how you operate your business in your, in terms of fair and transparent dealings with people, as well as you, how you deal with your other colleagues in the industry and clients as well. And if someone was needing support in relation to the services that you've mentioned, whether it be decluttering or assistance with cataloguing their photos, how can they find someone in their local area? Yeah. So Institute of Professional Organisers has a find an organiser directory on their website. Uh, so that can, you can be used to search by area or by need. So a lot of organisers will also offer service virtually. So if there's someone not quite the right, if you can't quite find the right fit in your area, there might be someone who can support you virtually. I know that seems unusual when a lot of our work is physically in people's homes, but I think the rise of virtual services is really acknowledging that a lot of what's happening for people in their homes is really about in their heart and mind and and overcoming sort of barriers in thinking or overwhelm and and support they need in decision making and organizers can also give guidance virtually as well about you know okay you could put this here and there so it's quite interesting yeah so the directory has listings of organizers you can go in there's bios pictures you can get an idea and links to their websites and it's a nice way to catch a few capture a few people in your area and to choose between. Yeah. Okay, that sounds like a very valuable service. And tell me, from your point of view, what have you found to be the most significant challenges that families face when a loved one dies? So definitely organisers, a lot of organisers get to meet people all through the, their lifespan. So working from children or expectant mothers even, expectant mothers, people with younger children, people with older children, people who've Kids have grown and flown, as well as older folks who are, you know, maybe becoming elderly or thinking of downsizing or needing to change their their living situation, as well as when people have passed. So we really see the whole lifespan. It gives us a really interesting perspective on the role of possessions and homes in over the lifespan. Uh, I think when I think one of the main challenges when someone dies for the f- the family or whoever is the one responsible for dealing with their affairs, look, I think the when it becomes problematic is often when that person has not really taken any steps prior to their death to arrange their affairs or to to deal with the lifetime sort of accumulation of possessions. You can actually accumulate quite a lot. Uh, if you're still living in the family home and you haven't had to downsize, you know, modern homes f- can hold a lot of possessions and that can be very overwhelming for uh, friends, family, loved ones to deal with after someone has passed. And when, when, no, when their affairs aren't organised, that can cause a lot of angst for the people left behind, wondering why, they, why they've been left with, uh, you know, a lifetime's worth of possessions to deal with that, that nothing was dealt with beforehand. And that, and they're often it's coming at a time when those people are actually quite bereaved and stressed and may not be at their full capacity and they're needing to deal with this. I think when I uh, work with with people who are nearing the end of their lives or they're, they're older or they're downsizing, I do get them to think about their legacy because I work also with people who are dealing with their legacy and to, to, to get them to think about what the legacy is that they are leaving behind for the people who will be coming in. To, to wrap up their affairs and deal with their possessions. And they've got an opportunity to make that a less unpleasant experience if they just take a few steps to do a bit of decluttering, to alert people to what is special to them or what has significance so that amongst all the stress and all the other things that people are dealing with that they 
they know what was important and special and that that doesn't go in the bin or that they can be really intentional about how they want to deal with that. They might want to share stories with their friends, their, their loved ones around items because, uh, you know, it might be this was very special to, to great-grandma Betty, but no one knows why because she didn't share the story about it with anyone. So sharing stories about why these things are special can be helpful as well as as people are making a lot of decisions about what to do. Yeah, does that does that answer your question? Yeah, I could totally. probably talk on and on about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's that's so true though. There is a big difference between what is valuable and what is sentimental. Oh, absolutely, it's a value to the person. So it may not look like it's of monetary value but it might have been very precious to the person. I mean, the other thing is that not all of us have the skills to know what does have monetary value. So if 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 you know that there's a family member who's collected a lot of antiques or valuable items, getting them to share a bit about what that item is, where they are, what their provenance is, because not all of us walk into a home and go, oh, I can see that's very valuable because we may not have the skills. And that, that's when other other specialists like auction houses and antique dealers can be valuable resource at that time to help families identify what was what is of monetary value so that they can sort of fulfill their role to wind up that estate in a financially responsible manner. So, but without knowing, sometimes people just walk in, they're so overwhelmed and you hear a lot of stories of was so overwhelmed. We had very little time to wrap up this property. It needed to be listed for sale. You know, I only had a week to do it because I've got family and other responsibilities and a lot goes in the skip bin, which is usually contrary to most people's values. And it's probably contrary to the values of the person who's passed. And it's often very heartbreaking for the people who are doing that work, the families that have to come in and they go, well, I've got no option here. The volume of possessions, I can't sort through this methodically. And that can be really contrary to their values and cause a lot, cause a lot of heartache. So I think that, I think I've touched on a few of the areas where it can be tricky for people in terms of space and possessions uh, after someone's died. Yeah. And is that when that they should really perhaps reach out and, and seek the services of someone from your, you know, association? Yeah. The, it's a common time. So organizers, life transitions would be a common time where people might think I need help with this. There's something new. I've never done this before. So that could be a downsize. It can be when people start to realize that oh, my health is not great and now I'm, I've got a big job and I need help with this. It can be, like you said, when someone dies and people are feeling a bit lost and it's a very big job, they might be looking out to say who could help me. So those life transitions are definitely where we would see people seeking the help of a professional organizer. And I think I think we're starting to normalize that this is something that's okay to get help with and that there's really a lot of people feel like they we're very independent Australians and we carry around a lot of shoulds about what we should be able to do without help but I think we're starting to get better at asking for help and not uh, and you know letting go of the shame that we might have carried around about needing help with something and organizers are very astute at handling when people are overwhelmed and they might be feeling some shame, we're, we're aware that that might be happening and we know how to get the job done, but we often are very, we know how to get it done sensitively as well. Yeah. And respectfully. And it's interesting that you talk about the culture in Australia and the feelings associated with that, because it's not always throughout the world that there's issues with decluttering, is there? Because, you know, we know that in Sweden, they actually have a practice that is specifically called death cleaning. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to hazard how I would actually pronounce the term in <laughs> Swedish. It's not that that great, my Swedish, but they actually have a, a practice called death cleaning, don't they? Yes, yes. So I haven't actually read, there's a very well-known book about this. I haven't actually read that one, but the principle is great uh, that you, you, it's really about engaging a, a level of mindfulness about your possessions and about your legacy and I have a lot of respect for that. I think it can be helpful for the person who's doing it uh, and I think it can be helpful for the people who come after as well. 
The, the book I, I believe that we're referring to is The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, and it was written by Margareta Magnusson, uh, mm. and we'll put the links in the uh, the show notes, as well as obviously the links to the uh, the Institute of Professional Organisers, so if you need any support there. But you were just mentioning the, the sensitivities that you have to deal with. Really, it seems to be in a lot of cases you come across, whether it's it's people People who are reluctant to to let go of items or the shame or guilt that they feel. What are some of the the challenging situations you've personally found yourself in? Talking openly about death and grief can sometimes be triggering. If you find you need support, please reach out to our support services and the bereavement organisations listed on our resource hub. All links are in the show notes of this episode. Yeah, people don't arrive at, you know, I arrive at people's homes and they come with all of their background, their experiences, whatever situation they're currently in. There's always a big context when we arrive to do a job. Uh, So I think it's always understanding that there's a lot about people we don't know at that point and that we're just starting out to get to know them. But it is a a process of rapidly getting to know people (laughs) and trying to understand what's important to them, what their values are and working in alignment with that. Definitely some of the more challenging situations is I do recall there was a family where there was two sisters who didn't have a great relationship and their father had been moved into aged care and they were in the process of of decluttering the house for sale. So, And occasionally we will walk into situations like that where there's high conflict and there's people not seeing eye to eye and being able to navigate that while still uh, achieving the outcome, which is the uh, you know, a, a clearer or cleared home, that can be challenging. It's not just about the stuff. I think uh, anyone working in this industry will tell you that it's not just about the possessions, it's about the people that are involved and their beliefs and their values and their relationship to their possessions. And that can get complex for people. Yeah. So based on your personal experience, what would you suggest that people do when they're trying to work through the administration tasks that are involved after a loved one has died? You know, where where do you suggest that they start based on your experience? I mean, my my experience my lens is very much focused on possessions because that's often where we are involved, but there's often a lot of tasks as well. I think I think an important aspect is prioritizing. Sometimes people come to us with a, a, a really high sense of urgency about you know, this, this, and this would be in any situation, not just after a death, is quick, I must declutter, I must do it all now and it must be done. And then when we get to know them, they've got a lot of other things happening, but they're feeling a lot of urgency around the possessions. But maybe even though it's causing stress, Maybe they need to attend to some other things first. So sometimes you see a bit of a false sense of urgency. So I guess when someone's wrapping up an estate, being able to prioritise what what are the immediate tasks that need to be done and what can wait because at that point it can feel very overwhelming and obviously emotionally people are often under a lot of strain and we're often not in those sort of critical sort of crisis situations. People people are not usually cognitively functioning at their at their best so i think it's about take take slowing down and working out what needs to happen right now and what can wait a few days and what can wait a few weeks and then just start just take that one day at a time or one week at a time and work through what you can and often the often the house or the home or the possessions can feel very urgent because it's very visible and occasionally there is urgency around the house, like if that estate needs to be wrapped up quickly for financial reasons, you know, the house is often the biggest asset and that would need to be attended to so that it can be progressed. So, But I think sometimes people feel a false sense of urgency around different things and it would be about prioritising. 
that's really good advice. And you mentioned, you know, there's obviously the services that the professional organisers can offer and come in and, and assist in those situations. You've mentioned that there's also auction houses. What other services have you had experience with, you know, after the death of, of someone, whether it be traumatic or, or just, you know, an expected death? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, professional organisers do offer sort of ad hoc emotional support as you're going through things. But if people are finding that they really, they need to debrief and discuss, then directing them to a counsellor who can really, who's trained and who can really focus in on that. Professional organisers are also there to try and do a job around possessions. So we need to stay in our lane in terms of what we're doing. But there's, you know, when you're going through people's possessions, it can trigger a lot of grief. And it, so it can be still part of that that process. But yes, getting getting sort of professional counselling or someone to debrief with, particularly if it's been a crisis, so that that they can gain some strategies around how am I going to do this task and manage my responses to this crisis as well. I think if we're talking about spaces and possessions, I think when we're clearing after a death, there is a lot that can't be often can't be donated or just in that, you know, uh, to get a second life. So there is auction houses for valuable things and there are ways to do Professional organisers also help people with ways to donate and discard things responsibly to give them a second life through different charities. Um, and that's often a very big part of what organisers are doing is arranging for charity furniture pickups for items that are less valuable, supporting people to list things on marketplace if that's what they choose to do, to sell things secondhand and to deliver items to charities. But there's often also the need for rubbish removal as well. So things like skip companies or there's a company called 1-800-GOT-JUNK or probably similar other businesses around in the community where you get a, a truck and two guys and they can pick up things that can go. And I know that company has a very strong sustainability focus as well. So that can there can be a role for those sorts of things as well. And you've had experience with hoarding disorder. Uh, obviously, that is a, a situation that might be very challenging for family members when they see a loved one in that, that situation. What do you suggest? Is there anything that you suggest in relation to, to those situations? So hoarding disorder is very complex and very challenging to work with. If someone comes to me discussing a family member with hoarding disorder for me personally I'm I'm a volunteer when my organizing business is voluntary so um, I don't go where I'm not wanted uh, so it is important to me personally that the person is wanting assistance and so I like to connect and engage with them to understand that in terms of what I would say to family members is to maintain a relationship with the person and make your relationship with them not just about the state of their home and their possessions because that can that can damage the relationship if it's always they're always feeling like this is the only thing that ever gets discussed if the home's in a state to still visit to keep visiting to keep going there because once people stop visiting sometimes this this the situation will deteriorate and to to lead by example, I guess, in terms of your own life, to attend to your own clutter uh, and your own possessions uh, and to be really gentle about suggesting that there are some things that they could do uh, or people that they could link with, like a professional organiser. There are therapists that can help with hoarding disorder as well and there are group programs like Buried in Treasures. Love to see more of that in Australia, that the, the group peer support for hoarding. So that would be the that that would be what I would say to people is I think above all maintain the relationship with your loved one. And would that be similar advice in relation to uh, perhaps neurodiversity and disability? Do you have any particular advice for yeah. either of those situations? I think I think those groups they're such a diverse so disability yeah, and neurodivergence it's very diverse so I probably can't say I have a go to piece of advice because I think there's so much diversity within those groups it will depend on what's what people are coming to be with yeah in terms of what I would say to them yeah 
but it seems to be that uh, open lines of communication seem to be key and regardless of who who you are. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I think that's yeah, the case is that we don't want people's relationships with their loved ones just to start to get focused on possessions and, and physical environments, even though that can be when you've got people in, in families, families and friends who may have different experience and different values, it can be hard for them to look past when someone lives differently to them and has a different environment. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong. It may just be different. And for me as an organiser, if that person comes to me and says, I want to change, then I'm there. And But I will be encouraging them to acknowledge that they might have people in their lives with different values different experience, different preferences, and to resist taking that on board, any judgment that's coming from other people who don't live in that property particularly. <laughs> Occasionally there's two people that live in a property, have very different preferences, but that's that's something that professional organisers deal with as well. How do we meet the needs of everyone in this house given that we've got people with different preferences and needs? Yeah. And. Has there been any incidents that have influenced your thoughts on on death? I, I I do think some of my professional experiences, seeing seeing loved ones left behind who are feeling very very distressed at the situation they've been left to deal with. So I do have some opinions about people attending to their legacy uh, for their loved ones, and that, because the loved ones often feel very ambivalent and conflicted when left with, you know, a very full, very disorganised affairs. They feel very conflicted. They're very sad. They love that person. They can't understand why they were left in that situation. So so I think attending to legacy and keeping my own affairs in order, encouraging people around me to try and do the same while still maintaining relationships with those people would be something that I do care deeply about uh, and but but always being respectful with whoever yeah if you've got a someone in your life who's who's older or has you know reached toward their end of their lives this food is still being respectful to them they do still need to have sovereignty and agency over their own possessions and make choices I think it's just pointing out to them that that they may you you may not have the time and the energy to to handle things in a way that they would prefer if they don't take steps now to to get their affairs in order. So so my work has influenced me. I've also had sort of a crisis situation in my own life that's in 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 informed some of my thoughts about that. It wasn't a death, but it was I had some family members in a very serious car accident and who have really lifelong injuries as a result of that. And and I think what that taught me was that life can change in an instant, that uh, that nothing is guaranteed. And, yeah, I think in terms of focus, I guess the focus for me as a result of that is when we say goodbye at the door in the morning, I send my kids to school, I, we make sure it's a good goodbye, we have good farewells that when I say goodbye to someone, it is a good farewell and that we don't leave uh, relationships with open regrets or open conflict. We try to to always be leaving parting on good terms because life is uncertain. We don't know what's next and we don't want to leave ourselves or other people with a source of long-term regret. I think that's probably the one thing that I would say about that matter. Yeah. That's um, something very good to say about that, actually, because <laughs> we, we really don't know, you know, what's, what's around the corner. And have you yourself done anything to prepare for your own death, Arwen? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't think I wouldn't have said that the things that I've done are specifically around that, but I guess, I guess given my experiences, you know, I do try to keep my affairs pretty well organized and in order and up to date. Uh, so I have wills, I have power of attorney, uh, I have a crisis plan for my business. So if something, and it is a, I if something happens to me and I am not able to give anyone any information, this is what would need to be done in my business to just do a crisis management of it or to wind it up if needed, if I'm not around. And I think having a little bit of that information available to 
uh, my loved ones or my friends and my colleagues that I've asked to help if that would happen. So I have asked people, could, would you step in and help my family if this happened and I needed to wrap up the business? I have an emergency care document for my children. So if I'm not around, what what happens to my kids? How can we keep some normality in their day-to-day lives? We have, you know, we've asked people to be guardians for them which, if they're still underage, if something should happen to us. The, I have close family members that know where to locate things in my home if they need to access documents if they need to access accounts and things, we have that set up so that that information is available. My paperwork's organised and easy to locate. Uh, it's not. It's it's not. It's all decluttered. Like so, it's very easy to find what what you need when you need it. So I think those are all. It's not just for in case of my own death. It's really about uh, other critical events as well. That there's some steps and resources for us to go to and other people to go to if that occurred, yeah. Lovely. And are there any cherished memories or traditions from your family that you had as a child that you find that you now honour in your own family with your own children? Yeah, probably around seasonal events, so like Christmas and Easter, that's probably where the traditions really would be focused. And I think that's pretty common for a lot of families. It's those seasonal events where the traditions come out. And when my children were younger, I put a lot of effort into building traditions for our family. They're older now, so they're not as keen on them, but I'm hoping that when they're older, they will revive them with their own family. Yeah, we can We can only hope, can't we? Yeah. <laughs> And given your own personal experience, is there any advice or encouragement that you'd like to share with others that we haven't already touched on? I think there can be a lot of, I'll do that later, in terms of spaces. So I'll declutter later. A one that I hear a lot is I'll organise my photos when I retire. That one comes up a lot. Like my retirement's this sort of mystical time where we're going to have all this time and energy. So I think the future generally is mystical. We've got all all this time and energy in the future. So it'll happen later. It'll I'll take. Uh, it'll happen when I'm on holidays, when life settles down. Which I think if we are doing that, it will be never. Um, so I think with Dick that and that applies to things like decluttering attending to sentimental items and getting those sorted photos, but it, it, it paperwork. So it's very common for me to to meet people who haven't really attended to any filing or paper organising for sort of like a five to seven years time frame. So things have got way out of hand. It's very overwhelming. And people often don't know where their important documents are at this point. So the passport's been put somewhere safe and we don't know where that is birth certificates in amongst a pile of old RSEQ or, or, you know, old car bills and insurance policies. So often meet people at that point. And there's always this later when I have time, when I have energy later. And I think things like wills and power of attorney, getting your legal affairs, financial affairs sorted often is being put off till later. But unfortunately, like I said earlier, things can change in in an instant and, and later may not work. You know, it's very hard to declutter if you have a change in health status. So we, we don't always see these things coming. So that is probably a very long way to say <laughs> not putting things off to sort of a magical later time is to some if things have got right away from people, it can be very overwhelming, but just start doing taking small steps to so get your affairs and your your house and everything in order. And what would you suggest to be sort of those first steps? Is it you know, locate your passport. Um, yeah, I look, I think, yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's coloured by my own experience though because so if you were going to do one thing first, I think it would be, you know, locate your, your vital documents, locate your birth certificates and your passport and to get your wills and power of attorney sorted. I don't think that's where a lot of people start though. They often start with the physical decluttering because that's so much more in your face and it can feel a little bit more achievable than 
thinking because because doing wills and power, paperwork and powers of attorney that actually requires really thinking about your death and I do think that that's confronting for most of us it also includes financial cost and making appointments and everyone is quite time poor but I probably would say that's where to start because that's that those are the things that the clutter can wait in a crisis generally unless it's causing the crisis but those things in a crisis are quite essential and those are the things that will be you will miss and will make the time more difficult if they're not in order. So that would be my advice. But uh, I don't think that's where a lot of people do start. So when we, if I'm doing a decluttering project with someone, usually we're doing the larger items, the, the things, the kitchen, the decor and clothing. And then we often move to paperwork because we've had to find it in all different parts of the house. So we just collate in one area and then we do paperwork. And we might have to do that for several hours. And then during that paperwork discussion, I will talk with people about, now, do you have your affairs in order? Can I, have you got a will? Have you got a, a power of attorney? You need to see a solicitor to work out what you need and to not ignore that. So that that's the time where, and we'll try and collate people's vital documents if we've located them. And if not, they've got it on their list to do to get a copy of their birth certificate or to renew their passport, that, those sorts of things. That would generally be, if I'm meeting someone, that's how I would often step them through. That's great to, to get a, an insight to how that process works. So thanks for that, Arwen. Is there anything else that you'd like to cover up on today? No, I think we've done a very holistic look at organisers and how that might intersect with end of life. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Catherine. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Don't Be Caught Dead, brought to you by Critical Info. If you liked the episode, learnt something new, or were touched by a story you heard, we'd love for you to let us know. Send us an email, even tell your friends. Subscribe so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you can spare a few moments, please rate and review us as it helps other people to find the show. Are you dying to know more? Stay up to date with Don't Be Caught Dead by signing up to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Head to don'tbecaughtdead.com for more information and loads of resources.